Now shall we turn to the Word of God, the letter to the Hebrews. Last Sunday morning we studied the first three verses of chapter 1. This morning I'd like to get through to the end of chapter 2 because this belongs together. Let me read chapters 1 and 2 to you. In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds, his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand? until I make your enemies your footstool. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. It is not to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. But there is a place where someone has testified, What is man that you are concerned about him? Or the son of man that you should care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present we do not see everything subject to him. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor, because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the presence of the congregation I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death 
he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Now it will be a great help in this morning's Bible study, which is a little involved, to have your Bible in one hand and this orange sheet in the other. We'll use both sides of it, but in particular the diagram, which probably means little or nothing to you as yet, I think it'll mean more to you as we go along. Now I don't know if you've ever met an angel, and perhaps neither do you either, because you can entertain them unawares. When they materialize, they look just like human beings. And they are a very real part of God's creation. And Jews tend to think much more about angels than Christians. There's a very sound reason for that. Though we shouldn't forget angels. They are just filling the pages of the New Testament with their ministry. They're a higher order of beings than human beings. And they did not evolve from men. If we're stuck with the idea that all life must evolve and must come from simpler forms of life, then we really have problems in believing in angels. But God created angels as a separate order of creation above man, below him, and therefore they are between us and God. They are superior to us in intelligence, in beauty, in strength, in power. One day we'll all meet them the moment you die when your relatives and friends can no longer do anything for you or look after you as a person though they may reverently look after your body. That moment, the angels will take you to be in Abraham's bosom. That moment, the angels will serve you. And so you'll all meet them. And if the Lord comes again before you die, then he's coming with all his angels, so we'll meet them that way. And we worship God this morning with angels and archangels and they watch this congregation and if one member of this congregation comes to Christ this morning, the angels rejoice. And if one Sunday school teacher misleads one of the little ones in the Sunday school, then the angel will report that back to heaven. Angels are terribly real, even though we don't normally see them. They are around us. We can claim their protection. It is not just little children who can go to bed and claim the protection of angels while they sleep. The hosts of the Lord encamp around those who fear him. Now the Jews thought a great deal about the angels for the obvious reason that the angels were between them and God. When they saw God, they saw him high and lifted up as Isaiah did. And they felt the great gulf, not only morally, but physically. God was a long way off. They had to call on his name. And he seemed so far away in highest heaven. And so they were glad that there was somebody in the gap in between. They were glad that there were angels to bridge the gap. And so when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up such a long way away, it seemed, then came one of the angels with a live coal off the altar and came right to Isaiah. It's as if the angel acts as the go-between, the mediator, and that's how the Jews thought of angels, for that's what they did. When God had something to say to the Jews, he sent an angel so often. When God gave the Ten Commandments, he didn't give those Ten Commandments direct to the Jews. He gave them first to the angels. The angels gave them to Moses, and Moses passed them on to Israel. Four stages in the journey. And so the law of Moses which was the basis of the Jewish religion, came through angels. They were God's messenger boys. It was therefore only a matter of time until the Jews began to ask, could the angels take messages back to heaven for us? And they began to pray not to angels, but through angels. Having received messages from God through the angels, they asked the angels to take messages back up. And they began to pray 
through angels. So angels figured very largely in their thinking and in their experience too. Abraham met more than one. And all through the Old Testament you find angels appearing and disappearing. But you do in the New Testament, in Jesus' life, from his temptation right through to Gethsemane and then again at the resurrection, the only crisis when angels were not present was his death. And Jesus had a personal retinue of 10,000 of them who would do anything he commanded them. There are myriads of them altogether, but personally assigned bodyguard for Jesus, 10,000 angels. And they're there in the book of the Acts. They're there opening prison doors and letting Peter out. They're there comforting Paul on his way to Rome. And if you read the last book in the Bible, it's just crammed with angels. So full of them, it would fill the universe if it wasn't for the fact that there's a space reserved for us too. But the heavens are just full of singing angels in the book of Revelation, as they are this morning. Our worship is just a tiny echo of heavenly worship that's going on all the time, and we're just joining in. And I think we should get that sense. The angels are not joining in with us. We're joining in with them. They're doing it all the time, and we just come for an hour and a half or so, and we join with the angels and archangels and cry, holy, holy, holy. Well, now, that's why the Jews thought a lot about them. Why then do Christians not think so much about them? Are we at fault here? Well, we are partly, and it's because I'm afraid we've passed through an era in our day when we got so materialistic and naturalistic in our thinking, even within church, that we stopped thinking about angels. And I was brought up in an era and in a church where they were never mentioned. I never thought about them. And I found that when I've preached about angels, it's been fresh material to, to people who've been going to church for years. Dr. Billy Graham knows this, and he's just about to publish a book on angels to enlighten people on this very important subject. But that's not the whole reason why we don't think so much about angels. I tell you why we don't think so much about them, because we've got Jesus. And Jesus is better than any angel. He is at one stage called the covenant angel in the Bible, but oh, he's more than an angel. The word angel simply means messenger. It doesn't necessarily mean wings and flowing robes. It means a messenger, man with something to say on behalf of someone else. And we don't listen to angels speak to us now because we've got Jesus. And we're taking the theme through Hebrews that Christianity is better than any other religion. That's the message of this letter to the Hebrews. And so to make the comparison, the writer takes the highest religion the world has ever known apart from Christ. And the best religion apart from Christ is the Jewish religion. But then he takes that and he compares it, the very highest religion known until Jesus came, and then he compares it with Jesus and he says, Jesus is better every time. Now, last Sunday morning, I looked at the first contrast, which only took three verses. The old religion of the Jews was a religion of prophets who spoke the word of God. And it was in bits and pieces, and now we have a much better revelation of God. Now God speaks to us in a son, not in fragments, but in one whole. Not in many forms, but in one form, the form of a man. And so we've got a much superior religion because we've got the son instead of the prophets. Now we go back to that other link in the Old Testament chain of God speaking. God speaks to the angels who speak to the prophets who speak to the people. Now we're taking those two middle links and the first link we took were the prophets and we said Jesus is better than the prophets. Now we take the other link and we say Jesus is better than the angels. If you've got Jesus... You're directly in touch with the Father. You're straight through. We don't need to pray through angels. We pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's maybe why angels don't figure so largely in our worship as they do in Jewish worship. Now we're going to draw out this comparison. And I want to do it by taking three periods of time. Now get your orange sheet and let me explain it. And if you remember that there are many people going to listen to this tape, I'd like to describe the chart for them. It's a chart that has three vertical columns, past, present, and future. We're not going to take them in that order. We're going to look at the present first, then we're going to look at the past, and then we're going to look at the future. That's the order in the letter to the Hebrews. But reading from left to right, past, present, and future. Then I've divided the left-hand column into two parts, vertically, 
Old Testament and New Testament, both of which were written in the past and represent two phases of God's dealings with us in the past. Under phase one, notice the dotted lines coming down. They represent God speaking in bits and pieces to the Jews. And you see that from God, the dotted lines go down to angels, his servants. Then they go further down to prophets. Then they go down to men through the prophets. And that's how God spoke in the Old Testament days. Notice the dotted line horizontally right along the middle. Above it is heaven and below it is earth. And at the far right hand end it becomes the new heaven and the new earth. So God's word came to earth in those stages through the angels in heaven to the prophets on earth to the men. But in the New Testament there's a much simplified procedure. Now there's a solid line. It all came at once, not in bits and pieces. And it came direct to the Son of God on earth, below that middle line. Right through, straight through, and men were directly in touch with the Son of God and with the Word of God. The Word of God had become flesh. It had taken the form of a man. And they were in direct touch in communication with God. Now we'll take more of this uh, diagram a little later. But connecting with the three columns, past, present, and future, or in the order in which I'm going to take it, present, past, and future, there are three comparisons this little letter makes between Jesus and the angels, which show that with Jesus we've got something better even than angels. I don't know how you'd feel if you went home and you noticed that all around the car as you went home or the bus or while you walked, there were a whole lot of angels traveling with you. You'd feel pretty important going up the cobbled high street with all these angels protecting you and marching by your side. I'll tell you something better. You go up the high street with Jesus when you leave this church, and that's ten times better. Why is it better? Well, there are three things said here about Jesus, one in the present, one in the past, and one in the future. Number one, Jesus did not sit with angels. Jesus does not sit with angels today. Number two, in the past, Jesus did not speak through angels. And number three, in the, in the future, and you may find this a bit surprising at first, but its main reference is future. Number three, Jesus did not suffer for angels. And this puts angels very much in the second place. Let's take the three points now. The first is this, Jesus did not sit with angels a son does not sit with servants. They have separate tables. Go to Buckingham Palace, you'll find many, many servants of the Queen. Maybe cut down in the near future. But nevertheless, you'll still find many servants in the palace. They live in a palace. You don't live in a palace. I don't live in a palace, but those servants do. Nevertheless, though they sit in a palace, they do not sit with the son of the Queen. It is not right that the son should be treated as a servant. That's why when the prodigal son came home and said, make me as one of your hired servants, that was out of the question. The father could never make the son sit with the servants. Never. And Jesus is the son of God, not just the servant. He's the son. And so when he ascended to highest heaven, he sat down, not with the angels, but at the right hand of his father. He's the prince. He doesn't sit with the servants. And the great contrast between Jesus and the angels is that the angels are simply servants, whereas Jesus is the Son. Which would you rather do, know one of the servants in Buckingham Palace or know the Son? Which would you rather do? If you knew one of the servants, it might give you access to one or two of the rooms. If you knew the Son, you'd get into every room, right? And if you want access, total access to God, it's the Son that you must know, not one of his servants. Now here the writer goes into the Old Testament, and this again, remembering that he's speaking to Jewish Christians, may be a little strange to some of us, and I haven't time to look up all these references for you. Take them home and this afternoon get your Bible, look up the references, go back into the Old Testament and see where they come from. But since he's talking to Jews, he's going to use their own Bible you should only really use the Bible towards those who will accept it. When the apostles preached to Jews, they quoted Scripture. When they preached to Gentiles, they didn't. 
It's rather an important point, this. You can't throw the Bible at someone who doesn't accept it yet. But when somebody says, I believe it, then you can quote it. And the Jews believed the Old Testament, so this writer says, I'm going to prove it from your own Old Testament. And there's a lovely pattern here. Let me try and analyze it for you. He says eight things by way of contrast between Jesus and the angels. And the, the pattern is this. He says three things about Christ, one about the angels. Three things about Christ, one about the angels. You can see his prejudice, can't you? And it's a good one. Three words about Christ to one about anybody else. But those two quadruple quotes make up eight altogether. It's as if he goes twice through this pattern and he gives them three texts from the Old Testament that tell you Jesus is son and one to tell you that angels are servants. Three more to tell his son, one more to tell you angels are servants. And this really puts them in their place. Now we could go through them in detail, but let me draw the total contrast the Son and his deity, the angels and their duty. That's the contrast. And it just separates them out in our thinking so that we never put Jesus among the angels. We see him high above them all and the angels simply as ministering spirits. At the moment, above us, but as we shall see in the third point, one day to be beneath us. And we'll be above the angels one day, not just with them, but above them. And they will come and ask you for their orders for the day. Can you imagine that? You may never have had the privilege or opportunity of having a servant on earth, but you'll have them in heaven. You will. Not just a room in heaven, but a room with a servant to match. You're looking forward to glory? Or do you find the whole idea a little embarrassing? Well, you won't. They'll be such wonderful ministering spirits that you will love the service they render to you. Well, now run through the text. Psalm 2 is the first one, and it's simply a psalm to point out that God never said to an angel, you're my son, today I have become your father. People have debated much about what the today means. Well, it means, I believe, the eternal day of God. God's today. Not any point in time, but God's today. And that's always, for God is the great I am. Today, it doesn't matter what day it is, is it the day of his birth? Is it the day of his ascension? Is it the day of his resurrection? No, it's all those days. They're all included in this today. It doesn't matter what today it is. Today, God is Father, Jesus is Son. Now, the angels are called sons of God, but they're never called the Son, capital S. That's never used as a name, whereas with Jesus, it's a name, Son. And the Father says, this is my Son. I'm just so pleased with him. 2 Samuel 7 is the next, originally applied to Solomon, but because Solomon was the son of David who would build God's house, he becomes a kind of shadowing of another son of David for whom the words said to Solomon would be even more true. You're my son, I'll be your father. The third quote, Psalm 97, that when Christ came into the world, the angels had to worship him. Now, when does this refer to? Again, scholars are divided, but I think I'm best telling you both the things they think and then telling you that both are right. When Jesus came to this planet the first time, the angels in heaven looked down at the little baby and they worshipped. But when he comes the second time, the angels will be there again and they will worship him again. So even though he comes into earth as a man, the angels still have to worship him. That's why we should never worship angels. We should never bow down before the angels. We should only worship Christ. And in the book of Revelation, twice, John made the mistake of bowing down and worshiping an angel. And frankly, if you saw an angel, you would be tempted to bow down and worship. If an angel came in real glory, and you realized that this was a supernatural visitor from another world, from heaven itself, and you had an angel in your home, you would tend to fall on your knees. But if you did, the angel would lift you up and say, don't worship me, worship Christ. The next quote is the first one about the angels after three about the Messiah, the Christ. And this one says, God has made the angels. Now that word is never used of Jesus. He is the only begotten son, but he's not made. 
To be made means to be created. To be made means that once you didn't exist, now you do. And the angels were made, and that word is never used of the Son of God. So he never became the Son of God at a certain point in time. He always was the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. Begotten, not made. But the angels were made. And God made the angels ministering spirits, servants, to do his will. And they do it through the powers of nature sometimes, wind and fire. And wind and fire can be the sign of an angel moving. I think that's what disturbed the waters at the pool of Bethesda, and a ministering spirit who was wind stirred up the waters, and an angel was doing it. So angels are simply there to do God's will. They're servants, not a son. Now come to the next four quotes, and I'm just going through them quickly so that you can look them up at home. The next four are concerned more with what is done. Psalm 45 says a wonderful thing. Did you watch the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II on television? Did you watch? Do you remember two things that happened? One was that they brought a scepter, a straight ornamented scepter, and they put it in her hands. You know, a symbol of an unjust reign is a bent scepter. Did you know that? A crooked scepter. It is the symbol of justice, and it's got to be straight. She's given that straight, upright scepter as a symbol of justice. And then she's anointed on the head with olive oil, the chrism, the christening, the anointing, the Christing. And she reigns. And these two things are said here in a psalm about Jesus that God said to Jesus, you are not only eligible to be king, you are capable of being king. Now, alas, those two things don't always go together. If you study English history, you'll find there have been kings and queens who were eligible but not capable. They may have been a son or a daughter of royalty, and they came to the throne, but they proved on the throne that they were not fit to rule. But other kings and queens of history have not only been eligible but capable. And Jesus is not only eligible because he's son of God, he's capable because he loves righteousness and hates wickedness. And I want you to notice that you're not a truly good man until you hate wickedness as well as love righteousness. I find there are plenty of people in the world who love goodness, but you do not find that they hate evil. And true goodness is composed of both those sides. True righteousness has a positive and a negative aspect. And a man may love good people and may love goodness and still not be truly upright in God's sight. A truly upright man is a man who hates evil when he sees it. Not just loves the good when he sees it, but hates evil. And so God says to Jesus, you've loved righteousness, you've hated wickedness, therefore here's the scepter. And here's the anointing with oil. I crown you as king, and your throne will last forever and ever. And the king of the universe today is Jesus. All authority in heaven and earth is, is given to him, and he sits there on the throne, a throne which he will have forever and ever, and he sits there with the straight scepter in his hand, the oil on his forehead, because when he was on earth, he loved righteousness and hated wickedness. That's never been said to an angel. Psalm 102 is the next. And here, again, we go back to the first three verses of chapter 1 in thought. Christ is the creator. He made it all, and one day he'll wrap it all up. It's, it's a lovely phrase, this. Sometimes the translators have translated it like pulling the curtains. You look up at the heavens, see the stars, and one day they'll just be pulled away as you opened your curtains when you got up this morning. You'll roll them up like a curtain. Others have said you'll roll them up like old clothes. Now there isn't... No, I nearly said something silly there. I, I nearly said there isn't one of you here wearing the clothes you were born in. Well, I didn't quite mean that. There isn't one of you here wearing the clothes now that you were wearing 30 years ago. I presume. <laughs> <laughs> we may get back to that. But in fact, the person you are, is the same. But you've worn so many different clothes in your lifetime. Have you ever worked out how many? You could just count your wardrobe now, but, I mean, go back over the years. How many clothes have you worn out? And when they're worn out, you bundle them up, and away they go. And this is the picture here, like a worn-out garment. This universe is wearing out. 
Last night, for a little mental relaxation, I was trying to read a book on Einstein's theory of relativity. <laughs> and, <laughs> though it's written for beginners, I'm, I'm just beginning to grasp it. But there I learned some fascinating facts. And I learned that the stars are all wearing themselves out and the sun is burning itself up. It's only a matter of time till it's all burned up, all worn out. You see, there's only one changeless feature in a changing universe, and that's Jesus. There's only one person who doesn't wear out, that's Jesus. All the universe is wearing out, change and decay, and all around I see. But Jesus is responsible for those changes, and he will roll it all up like a garment, like a worn-out suit of clothes. He'll roll up this universe, but he will still be there, for his years fail not, he changes not. No angel is like that. Psalm 110, sit here, says God, at my right hand until all your enemies are your footstool. Now, archaeologists in Egypt dug up a footstool from one of the ancient Egyptian tombs. I think it was Tutankhamun's tomb. And there was this footstool for a throne, and on it were painted the faces of all the kings that man had conquered. So whenever he sat down, had the satisfaction of looking down between his feet and seeing the faces of those he had conquered. It's a vivid picture. And it was the, the habit in the ancient world when you defeated somebody to paint their face where you put your feet. They were under your feet. Do you realize the devil's face will be painted on Christ's footstool in heaven? It's a thought. Sit here until I make all your enemies your footstool. He's never said that to an angel. And so having said three more wonderful things about Christ, he goes back to another thing about the angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent to serve whom? Christ? God? No. Sent to serve you in this congregation this morning. Those who are to inherit salvation, the angels are sent to serve you. They are your servants. That's an incredible thought. That's why they're so thrilled when you become a Christian. They can begin their service to you because they're terribly afraid that if you don't become a Christian, the service they will have to render is to God, and it'll be a ministry of judgment to you. Now, that's the first main point this morning. Let me move on quickly. Not only did Jesus not sit with angels, he did not speak through angels. Now, Hebrews is very practical. It's full of warnings, and the first four verses of chapter 2 are a serious warning. It is this. If we have so much better a message than the Jews ever had, and they were punished for ignoring the message they got. How much more will we? Greater responsibility brings greater privilege. Now, how much better is our message than theirs? Very simply, their message from God came through the angels, through the prophets to them. It was third hand by the time they got it. We got it first hand. The message came in the shape of the Lord, the Word made flesh. The prophets witnessed to the old message. Apostles have witnessed to the new message. And they not only gave us message, they gave us miracles to prove the message was true. And wherever the true message is preached, God confirms the word with signs following and things happen. And you have a double testimony. You not only have the word of the gospel from first-hand witnesses who saw Jesus and heard him speak, you have miracles of the Holy Spirit, gifts of the Holy Spirit to confirm the truth of what's been said. You've got it in the eye and in the ear. You've got it visually. You've got it audibly. You heard it both ways. You heard and you saw the message that we have. Now, the Jews never got the message in this way. And therefore, and I tremble to say this, it's the first terrible thing said in the letter to the Hebrews. There is nothing you need do to be damned except ignore this message. It's the only thing you need do. You don't need to have done wicked things. You don't need to have said a single wrong word. The only thing you need to do to go to hell after hearing this message is to ignore it. That's all. And when you consider that, there must be thousands heading for hell in England. Thousands on no other ground than that they've neglected such a great salvation. You see, if God took all that trouble, not just to send angels and prophets, but if God sent his own Son and confirmed that word with miracles so that you had no excuse for doubting its truth, and you deliberately ignore it, 
or just drift away. Now, here's a nautical term. The letter to the Hebrews was written by a man who'd done a lot of sailing. He keeps bringing in nautical terms. And the one used here is drift away. It means not to have an anchor down and just float along towards the rocks. man who doesn't put his anchor down and just basks in the sun on the deck of his ship and just lets it drift towards the rocks is a man who's an absolute fool. But most people go to hell by drifting there, not by deciding to go there. They go there because they've had a chance to get an anchor firm to the rock and they don't throw the anchor overboard. They don't get linked onto the truth. They listen. They're interested. And then they forget it and just drift away. Just neglect apathy and indifference. Yesterday we had Dr. Marion Ashton here, as you know, for a conference, and I was talking to her husband, Dr. Lee Ashton. He was telling us this. He said, I prepared an address, and I was invited to go and speak to a youth club in the Midlands, and he said, I went to this youth fellowship, young people, and he said, I gave this address, and he said, they just met it with stony indifference. And he said, all the way home I was really worried. He said, Lord, is there something wrong with me? Was that a dull address? And he was really worried. He thought his speaking days might be over, I think. And he, he just didn't get through at all. But ne the next week he was invited in London to speak to a group of nurses and young people from Thailand. And he decided to give the same address. And he said, this time it just really went over. He said, I realized that they were hungry, that they'd got an appetite, that they couldn't get enough of God's word. And he said, it was the same address. He said, I was so relieved that it wasn't me. Same address, but in one case, no appetite, neglect, indifference. In the other case, soaking it up. And here the letter to the Hebrews says this. If Jesus is so much better than the angels, how shall we escape if we neglect this thing that is so much better? You see, in the Old Testament, nobody was punished for neglecting or ignoring the message. They were punished only for direct contradiction of it in life. They were punished for disobedience. They were punished for transgression, but not for ignoring it. But in fact, in the New Testament, it's more serious. There is a specific punishment here of eternal lostness to those who just ignore, to those who hear and drift away to those who never put an anchor of faith into this truth, to those who just let it slide Sunday after Sunday, week after week, month after month, year after year, without even realizing that they're drifting straight towards the rocks and disaster. That's all you need to do to go to hell. If Jesus is better than the angels and people were punished for disobeying the angels, how shall we escape if we neglect? You know perfectly well if you neglect your garden what will happen to it. You know perfectly well if you neglect the paintwork on your house what will happen to it. You know perfectly well if you neglect your health what will happen to it. Then how will you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? Isn't it strange that people can apply common sense to every other department of life but their souls and can neglect that and drift on as if it'll all turn out right in the end. That's the second contrast and it's a serious one. First contrast, he did not sit with angels. Second, he didn't speak through angels. Third contrast, he did not suffer for angels. Now, at this point, I have a wonderful conception to share with you. The British Association for the Advancement of Science is coming here in August. We're going to try and arrange an evening service of science and religion. We've already started inviting scientists to come along to it. In a sense, I wish they were here this morning. Listen, God has decreed that everything, everything, notice that, everything is to be subject to men. He's decreed it. And that decree has never been cancelled and it will be fulfilled. Now science is feeling after the fulfillment of that decree. And a scientist cannot help going on to discover. We say, should a scientist discover this thing? A scientist can't help it. I've done a bit of science and I know once you're onto something, you want to find out about it and it, it's almost like a drug. You've got to know. You can't just stop. 
You're searching for man's conquest of things. And so our scientific discoveries are a partial fulfillment of this text that God has decreed that everything shall be subject to men. And when we conquer space, as we reach out in our puny way to a tiny little corner of space and get to the moon, we're partially fulfilling this text. We're subjecting something new to men. But having said that, which is God's decree and the ideal, think of it. We've been made just a little lower than the angels. What is man that you care for him? What is man that you think about him? You've made him just a little lower of the angels. You've given him dominion over everything. That's what God said in Genesis. Let them have dominion. Let them be in charge of the thing. And science has increasingly put us in charge of things. Let everything be subject to man. Now that's the ideal. But I've said that science is only a partial fulfillment. Because if there's one thing that science is saying, it is that things are getting on top of us. I don't need to underline the fact of pollution just to give you one illustration of this. It seems as if we can control everything but ourselves. And that's a real handicap to science. For it means that almost every scientific discovery there has been of any major kind has been used to destroy as well as to save. And even things are getting on top of us now and we're wondering just how long we can go on living on this little spaceship called Earth. The air is running out. The fresh water is running out. We just wonder how long we can keep going. And, and we, we don't yet see all things in subjection to men. It's an ideal that has not come true even with all our science. And 75% of all the scientists of history are alive today. That's been the graph growth in scientific knowledge. Knowledge is doubling every 10 years, will soon double every 5 years. And we're trying to get all things into subjection to ourselves, but we can't even feed the mouths of the people on earth yet. And we can't stop war yet. We can only make it more scientific. And so we don't see the ideal in the actual. What do we see then? We see man fighting a losing battle against things. But we see Jesus as the pioneer of the fulfillment of this decree. We see in heaven a man who is above all things. We see a man who was made like us a little lower than the angels, but who is now way above them. We see a man in charge of the universe, and already this decree has been fulfilled in the case of one man. One man is now on top of everything. One man is now in control of all the universe. One man. Now this was not true of Jesus before he was born, because he was not then a man. He was the Son of God. So if he'd been on that throne before he was born, you could not say that all things are subject to men. But we do see now one who was made a little lower than the angels, now high above them, now controlling all things. And so it's true for one man so far. Now here's the glorious truth. It's going to be true for hundreds and thousands of others. You see, Jesus has conquered all of known space. And therefore he can move freely around the universe, totally freely, Look at the efforts we make just to take a tiny, we say it's a giant leap for mankind. Giant leap? It's a flea bite compared with the distance of space. It's a tiny step. It's not a giant leap, but Jesus just stepped out without a spacesuit, right out into space, into the universe. And one day you and I will travel the entire universe. You know, people ask me, where will there be room in heaven for us? If there's a new universe and you can travel anywhere in it, I guess we won't be on top of each other's corns all the time, will we? Think of it. All things subject to us. We know that even in his lifetime this was true of Jesus. He could speak to the wind and the waves. He could turn water into wine. He could multiply loaves and fishes. One day that power will be yours. And the universe will be subject to men. Won't science look silly then? Really will. It looked like a child in a kindergarten trying to build bricks to the day when all things are subject to men. Now we come to the close of this. You see, the world, the universe, subject to man, that's God's decree. He wants us to conquer space. He wants us to be in complete control of all that he has made. And he never gave that to angels. It's man who is to be in charge of the universe. And we already see one man in charge of it, and we're going to join him. And many sons will come to glory. There's one son already in charge of the universe and many sons will come to glory and share his control. That's what we're looking forward to. But now we come to the serious side. 
Why can science not do this for us? Shall I tell you why? Because science can only see the mental need. It cannot see the moral need. Do you see the difference? Science says if we will only apply our mental faculties, we can get in charge of everything, we can subject everything to ourselves. No, you can't, scientist. You're ignoring the moral factor. You've got to learn to control yourself before you can control everything else. And this Jesus who came to earth to be made flesh and blood, a little lower than the angels, that he might be the first man to get above them again and to take control of the universe, in this he is our pioneer, that's the word used here, the blaze, the one who blazes the trail, the one who goes first and prepares the way for others, the pioneer of our salvation. He came to earth not only to become man, that he might take over the universe as men, he came that he might die and put men right morally as well as mentally. He came to deliver them from something that no man can control, death. The fear of death strikes even the scientist's heart. Every scientist dies. Every great man dies. However much we achieve, we may stand on the moon, but we'll become dust on the earth. And this bondage, the one fact of our existence which we cannot get on top of, is due to the fact that there is something else we can't control either, and that's sin for death is the result of sin. And if we're going to control the universe, somebody had to come and deal with those two things. Somebody had to come and not only become man, they had to be exposed to all the horrible pressure of temptation. And only a sinless man could know the awful pressure that there can be of wanting to do something wrong. We only feel it, the pressure of temptation, because, well, we only feel it to a degree because we're sinners. The holier you get, the greater the pressure of temptation. Make no mistake. You start as an unbeliever, you don't feel the pressure very much. You become a Christian, you begin to feel the pressure a bit more. You get nearer to Christ, the pressure of temptation gets fiercer. This is a proof to you that those who can sympathize most with sinners are not those who've sinned, but those who've been sinless and been tempted. Can you see that? We often think that if I've sinned, I can sympathize most with someone who's struggling with that same sin. Not at all. On the other hand, if I've never been tempted with that sin, I can't sympathize either. The person who can sympathize most with a, a person under temptation and who's sinning is a person who's felt all the force of that particular temptation but who has not sinned. Isn't that right? They know the pressure more than anyone else. And that one is our Jesus. We were all our lifetime in the grip of one big fear of one thing we can't control, death. We can put it off for a bit, but we can't stop it. And no scientist in the world has yet discovered any way of controlling death. And that's because we haven't discovered any way of controlling sin. And that's because we weren't saved. And that's why the word salvation is the key word in our study this morning. Not the word angels, though it occurs about 12 times, but the word salvation, which occurs in each of the three sections of our study. The world is to be subject to man, but unfortunately man is subject to death. Who can break through? The Son of God has broken through. No angel died for us. And Jesus didn't die for the angels. That's the other side of this incredible truth. Angels have sinned. One third of them have sinned. One out of every three angels have sinned and therefore forfeited their right to go on living in heaven. But none of them will benefit from the death of Jesus. Not one. When an angel who has lived in heaven in the presence of God sins, then there's no alternative but for that angel to go to hell with the devil. No alternative. But with men who have not lived in heaven, God sent his only son to earth, not just to become man, but to be tempted and become a great high priest and lift us up and bring many sons to glory and set us above the angels and in charge of the universe. That's my future in Jesus Christ and it's yours too if you know him. And if you don't know him and forget what I've said and neglect and ignore this truth, you will not finish up on the throne of the universe in control of everything. 
you finish up in hell with everything on top of you. That's the alternative. It's your decision which it shall be. Behind all this, and I close with this last phrase which I haven't mentioned yet, is God. For whom and through whom everything exists. Now we believe the through whom, but we often forget the for whom. You're not here this morning for you, you're here for God. You're not here that God may bless your purposes and plans. You are here that you may do his purposes and plans. You're not here primarily to enjoy God. You're here that God may enjoy you. For whom all things exist. To bring many sons to glory is not glory for me. It's glory for God. That's what he made you for. When God made man, people say, why did he make man? The answer is very simple. He wanted a larger family. He had one son. He so loved that son and enjoyed his company that God said, I want more sons and daughters. Let's make man just like us. So he made man. And when Jesus came to earth, the men he got hold of and the women, he was not ashamed to call them brothers. And he came back to God and said, here am I and the children you've given me. Here's the family. You wanted more children? Here they are. I brought many sons to glory. I've saved them. And now they can control everything with me. And you can have your family. Let us pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, Thank you that you wanted a bigger family, that you chose to share your love with us, that you didn't speak through angels to us, you spoke through the Son. We feel so close to you through him. We pray this prayer through him, and we have immediate access to you. Lord, we can hardly imagine the future that is going to be ours. Everything subject to us, angels serving us, but Lord, we know it's only because Jesus was our pioneer and went ahead of us to prepare a place to take charge until we get there. So we just bow in wonder, love and praise and with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven we lord and magnify your glorious name saying holy, holy, holy through Jesus Christ, our pioneer. Amen. There's another hymn on the back of this sheet. Number two, Jesus, the name high over all in hell or earth or sky. Angels and men before it fall and devils fear and fly. Number two on the sheet.